Out to center. This is cranked. It's way back. It is gone. Welcome back to the Couch GM Podcast. We have an awesome episode in store for today. As much as I've been curious about what it's like to be in the front office or to be a general manager of a sports franchise, after all, this is the Couch GM Podcast. In the same light, I've been just as curious as to what it's like to be a sports agent representing the players on the other side of that equation. Show me the money! Today, I am thrilled and honored to have on Nick Lubasic, who is the owner and founder of Northwest Sports Management Group, based here in Vancouver, Washington. I've had the pleasure of having a few of Nick's clients on the podcast already to help share their stories. He represents multiple big leaguers as well as some of the top prospects in the game, including Noble Meyer, who is the Marlins number one overall prospect and the 10th overall draft pick in the 2023 MLB draft. We dive into his background of how he started this company, how he got into becoming a sports agent, and much more. This podcast is sponsored by my friends at Black Label Supplements. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And if you're taking creatine, you got to check out their sour watermelon flavor, their pure power creatine. This is my favorite flavor to date. Grind, hustle, win, repeat. And if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing any type of property, make sure to reach out to myself, the Couch GM, Connor Webb, to hit a home run with your mortgage financing needs. I'm a mortgage broker full-time for my full-time career. The Couch GM has been a side passion up to date, and my goal is to become the go-to lender for all sports fans and athletes in the Pacific Northwest. Here's the pitch from 50 to the Couch GM. (sighs) Gone forever. Just like a good pitcher, your mortgage lender needs to throw the right options your way. Otherwise, it's gonna be sent for about 500 feet over that fence. So if you're an athlete or a sports fan in the Pacific Northwest that's thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing, make sure to reach out to myself, Connor Webb, also known as the Couch GM, to hit a home run with your mortgage financing needs. Now someone get a new pitcher out there. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, Nick, thank you for joining me today. I've been looking forward to this episode for a while now. Uh, myself, ha- having a background in finance, marketing, and just being a sports guy, I've been really interested in in the scene of what it's like to be a sports agent. So I'm excited to pick your brain and hear your story with how you started your company and some of your experiences. So again, thank you for joining me. And let's start with your your background and your story. How did you get into sports in the first place? And then how did you end up getting into you know starting a sports agency? You know, um, first off, Connor, thanks for having me. I mean that, you know, you've had a couple of my clients on here and uh, being a local guy, I really um, am a fan of people from the Pacific Northwest and people who are committed to, to baseball. So thank you for having me. Definitely long overdue. Um, happy to be here. And yeah, about my background, I mean, in a nutshell, just grew up in a sports family. My father, a local dentist, um, played football at USC. So I kind of grew up in a, in a family um that was, uh, you know, from a, a 1960s committed, dedicated, disciplined football man, um, really preached competitiveness. Um, and so from a young age, I just loved to compete, um, played all, a lot of sports. And, um, you know, eventually that turned into um, just playing throughout high school, an opportunity to play two sports in college. And um, thought I was going to make it to the NBA with a state title way back in 97 at West Lynn, But uh, 6-1 had something to do with that, I think. So... <laughs> Thank goodness I was left-handed, threw the ball, um, loved pitching, um, and Kurt Daniels drafted me uh, back in 2001, um, which then started a pro career with the Chicago White Sox. And um, yeah, in a nutshell, when I got done playing there, I kind of, I wanted to stay in baseball. I had a a dear friend who gave me a good piece of advice. He's like, hey, Nick, you know, you've been in baseball really, you know, since, you know, you were a kid, 1997, you know, professionally since 01. And He's like, you should probably look at this like you have a PhD in baseball. Because, you know, we always hear about guys that get done playing sports and they go into banking or they go into whatever it may be, sales of sorts. And um, I thought that was really great advice. It was kind of like looking at my career like, all right, you know, failed big leaguer, uh, two shoulder surgeries in AAA, you know, kind of that proverbial story. But it didn't have to It didn't have to end. Um, and I, I literally just chose being an agent because I wanted to work for myself. Uh, my father's self-made man. Um, created a dental practice. Uh, I really admired how hard he worked and how much he worked, but the fact that he he bet on himself, you know, he went at it alone. Um, and some people I think are kind of built for that and some aren't. And I just think for me, 
corporate corporate America is not my calling. I think it was good for me to kind of be my own show and go out on it alone and try to figure it out. So that's what I chose to do. I just wanted to be my own boss and stay in baseball. That's awesome. Yeah. And you, you have that experience of the grind of going through the minor league so you can empathize with your clients when they're going through the same things that you experience as well. So when you were kind of nearing the end of your, your playing days, were you thinking about maybe coaching or how did you get that initial foot in the door about, Hey, sports agent being becoming a sports agent is the route that I want to go. And then what were your next steps to actually, you know, take, take that next step? You know, when I got done playing, I went to work for a gentleman in Portland by the name of Lynn Lashbrook, uh, Lashbrook, it's been a few years, but he runs sports management worldwide. That was kind of my first taste at, at sports agency. He was predominantly football. Um, and that was kind of a short lived you know, career jump for me, if you will, if you can even call it that, more like an internship. Did that for a few months um, and liked some things about it. I didn't really get much into the representation side at that point in time, and nor was I ready. Um, And so I actually left out of sports and jumped into finance and did some uh, subprime lending um, in 2008, which if you remember those years, that didn't last long either (laughs) due to the the fall of the the economy then. Um, Mm -hmm. So that kind of vaulted me back to sports um, I had a, a real database of kids when I was home in the off seasons, when I was playing professionally, um, I would do lessons. That was kind of my source of income, right? I had to work a job, didn't make any money back in, in 01 to 06 playing minor league baseball. So a lot of guys would work in the off seasons and, and I chose coaching and instruction. Um, you know, my father's a real natural coach. Again, I referenced him before he's had a massive impact in my life. Um, and so I really leaned into that. Um, loved it. And, and really when the subprime lending thing fell apart, you know, I went at the sports agency and funded it in large part, um, being an agent by coaching on the side, you know, creating, um, lessons and opportunities. And, um, you know, I really grinded kind of doing that and then kind of started creating what would turn into 15 years later, the sports agency. Right on. So, you know, the, the whole, uh, the big short happened in 2008 and all that you get out of out of finance and mortgage, um, you start your, that's when you start your first business is, is right then with, with becoming a sports agent. Yeah. I filed the, the business license. My first draft was the 09 draft. So October 08 okay. was when we started and, um, yeah, I just went at it, went at some, some former clients of mine that I, or, uh, teammates of mine that turned into clients, um, okay. just asking questions and just kind of selling yourself. I mean, it was like, Hey, I, yeah. I feel like I, I, I know people, you know, I respect you. You're the kind of person I want to work with and what's your current agent doing, or do you even have representation? And, um, and then I went at it, uh, that first year, um, Daryl Siciliani out of uh, Madras, Oregon, Eric Staver out of the university of Oregon, a kid named Braden Tolis. All three guys went in the top 10 rounds of that draft that year. Joey Wong at Oregon state, whose father I played for dear friends still to today. Um, uh, Alex Berg, currently working alongside Bob Melvin in San Francisco. You know, these are all guys that were like my very first draft class that I was kind of winging it. I mean, and now I laugh at about it and, and share stories with with a lot of those guys. But um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, thinking back and I haven't thought back, you know, in a long time. It's probably why I'm smirking. But, um, you know, it was uh, trial by air, trial by fire, you know, um, but really just putting yourself out there and, and going after something that I really believed in. Um, I care deeply for whoever I represent. Um, you know, that, that, that's really important. I mean, you gotta be, when you're trying to help someone's career, that's quite a responsibility in my opinion. So, um, I give every client everything I got and, um, and I'm so thankful for those guys giving me that opportunity, you know, I guess almost 15 years ago now. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I can only imagine first starting out, it's like you, you might have had representation when you were playing. So you kind of saw what you like, what you don't like from a sports agent that kind of led into how you run your business now. But it's like you're just starting out. You know, I don't know. You don't know what you don't know until you get into it and you just experience it. And like, hey, you know, I'm going to represent you the best way that I know how and anything that you need, I'll be there, be there for you. So, yeah, I was going to ask, you know, what was that feeling when you landed your first client and then walk me through the story of, um, you know, your first player that actually made it to the big leagues. Well, I got really fortunate. You know, I was um, playing for the Chicago White Sox organization within it all those years, 05, double A, that was the year they won the World Series. And then 06, we're all in triple A. Um, and and I was one of the, the number one or two starter on the team kind of early out of the gate. And then my shoulder fell apart. 
but all my reason I bring that up is all my teammates started getting called up to the big leagues. So when I got done about two years later, you know, I was not afraid to go up to a couple of roommates of mine, uh, Chris Stewart, who played almost 14 years in the major leagues, um, Aaron Wasserman, um, two guys that, that are kind of journeymen. People probably don't know their names, but I went to, to those guys and Aaron was the first one. I just said, Hey, you know, he was in triple A. I said, Aaron, I'd love to be your agent. You know, we were roommates from a ball on up and Aaron was all about it. He's like, yeah, let's go. And so he debuted in, in Fenway and uh, I'm a new agent with a major league client. I mean, <laughs> talk about the grace of God right there. That doesn't happen very often. I think for an agent that kind of went out on his own, a lot of guys, you know, when they start agencies, they'll jump on with a big firm or they'll, they'll just be a part of it. But I was a, a small mom, pa shop. And, and that was my first big league client out of the gate. Um, and so, yeah, that was um, quite exhilarating and, you know, not so terrifying. You know, I think that's, I don't know, I probably too um, dumb or un I don't know, just I wasn't afraid of it. I just loved the challenge and um, just kind of looked at it like, hey, this is my roommate for four years. We're still friends today. I was standing at, you know, next to him at his wedding. So to me, it was like, you know, this is my homie. I'm going to take good care of this guy and help him on his road. So, so yeah, that was, uh, was really how I started with, with landing my first big league client, a former, former teammate. Man, I can only imagine sitting there in Fenway Park. You're watching your first one of your first clients on the field. It's like, is this real life? That'd be that'd be surreal. So, I walk me through a day in the life of what it's like to be a sports agent. I know that's a everything under the sun is what you do, but what's your day to day look like? Yeah, I joke with my wife. I'm like, you know, don't ask me to use a screwdriver or a drill. My the tool I use is my phone. It's like every yeah. agent will tell you that. That's what I I'm really good at using that tool. Uh, you're on your phone a ton. You're, you're texting constantly. You're fielding calls. Um, you're, you know, when you're sitting down on a rainy day, there's emails you got to correspond with, but it's such a real time industry that, um, you've got to just kind of be ready at any moment's notice to, to field calls. Uh, obviously you start representing 15, 20, 25, 30 guys. It's just more volume, more calls, draft classes, minor leaguers, major leaguers, independent players, players out of the country. Um, you know, there's, there's really an amassing of, of people and responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis that you've got to juggle, you've got to organize, you've got to have your processes and your systems in place. Um, because again, these are all careers and, you know, you, you think about it as an agent, you're really, you're impacting them. Um, you can impact them positively and obviously negatively if you're not on top of your job. So, you know, day-to-day -day life, um, that's probably the biggest thing. If, if I'm awake, I'm working. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that you've got to balance your home life as a family man with two young children. That's obviously really important to me. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very supportive, like a lot of, a lot of us in the world with a loving wife who understands that. And, um, you know, on, on airplanes, probably every week, it seems like every other week, somewhere to be. Um, so yeah, just a lot of management, but, uh, I love management. I love people. It's, it's what I really enjoy. So even despite all that, that workload, it, it really doesn't feel like it. It's just, uh, it's fun. It's just talking to people all day long. Yeah. And I'm curious to kind of go through the process of, you know, what a player experiences throughout their career. So starting with how early can a player initially start getting representation from a, a sports agency? Uh, when they're two years old, three years old, and they can pick up a battery. Okay. Ball. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I'd say it jokingly, but you know, you, there, there's, agencies and agents and connections that are made through all walks of life. Um, as far as real representation, where you're a value trying to communicate on behalf of somebody, you're, you're talking about those high school years. And then that's when those connections can get made. And those high school kids can have agents represent them. And um, there's rules and there's some regulations there, of course, that I won't bore you with. But definitely contact can, can literally be made um, really at any point in time. Um, and I think part of part of our advantage with, with the, the agency that we run is that we've got a real pulse um, throughout the Pacific Northwest, you know, even into the youth ranks. So we, mm -hmm. we really, my group and I, we really have a good feel for these young kids coming up. And honestly, the 10 year olds, the 11 year olds, the 12 year olds, I know it sounds crazy, but you kind of do an analysis of the family, the parent, the, the skills, the athletic upside, you know, more importantly than all of it, the makeup as we refer to it, the character, um, there's, there's real things that we all are scrutinizing, um, because being a big leaguer, everybody's talented. It, it's really, you gotta have a lot of, you gotta love to fail. You gotta have a lot of resilience. People mm -hmm. that struggle with failure 
literally go play a different sport or go play soccer or something like this sport is not for everybody um because you got to just love to fail um you got to love that grind and if you can kind of link that up with the right person right family you typically have a really successful client at some point awesome and then going through the draft process i'm sure it's a bit different when you have a noble meyer compared to you know another average player that's looking to just get drafted by anyone but what does that draft process look like you know let's say they get out of college or they're nearing the end of high school are you sending out tapes to a you know mass email to all 30 teams saying hey this is who i have what does that entire process look like from the the moment that they enter that draft area until they walk across the stage you know things have changed a lot in 15 years you know now there's there's databases with information that are shared within all the organizations uh, players are are uploading information um, yeah, organizations definitely reach out every year. Hey, who are you representing? Who are you looking at? You know, you thought about this guy or that guy. So it's a massive, you know, it can be a massive referral system. Um, but, you know, to be honest, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of common lines, no matter where you're drafted. Um, yeah, you definitely are probably lobbying and pushing for guys to get drafted versus a noble who everybody wants to draft. Um, but, you know, that spectrum one to 20, um, the game is really constrained. I mean, it has been a, a ton of, uh, you know, we've seen the elimination of jobs. Um, you know, we've lost levels. So it's really hard to get into professional baseball. Um, these clubs really covet those 20 picks. I mean, they, they need to know that if they draft a guy that that guy's going to sign. So the, the, the term signability is something that's used all the time as a player signable um, because clubs don't want to waste, you know, any resources on players that aren't interested in turning professional. So really the job, um, absolutely becomes feeling out the market for your clients, um, you know, communicating with clubs, trying to find that best fit for the player and the organization. Um, but the draft, I always tell everybody, I, I love it. It's, it's chaotic. It's a lot of times, you know, those, those clubs won't divulge their, their real numbers or cards until minutes before picks, um, sometimes hours. But um, it's exhilarating. It's an exhilarating day. You've really got to be on it. Um, but I, I love that day. It's just, it's, it's like, I'm so bummed. It's only one day out of the year. It's a really fun time. If you enjoy negotiating and, and wheeling and dealing and chaos. And I, I thrive in that. I love that. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I've, I've always been curious about, you know, how teams can, uh, get players for like overslot value or something to, or to get someone to float down in the draft. I'm curious what that process looks like in the negotiation and, because, you know, technically any team can draft any player, correct? Even if, but then, you know, if the player wants more money than they are getting, you know, offered, then could they still choose to, to sit out or what does that process look like? You know? Yeah. You know, if you look at draft mechanics, I mean, you can look up the numbers, numbers are everything. They tell us everything. And really those, those slot values, um, can be completely meaningless, you know, really, yeah, there's a budget in top 10 rounds that a club's got to stick to. And there's values per pick, but a lot of times clubs are trying to, you know, like any business, they're just trying to be really fiscally responsible. They're trying to amass as much talent as they can for the best price that they can achieve that within. So, yeah, those, those slot values can, can you know, they're like, you know, I don't know, road markers on the road that we have to kind of abide by and start with, but they can go up and they can go down. Um, you'll see clubs sign senior signs and a, you know, easy number, call it a half million dollar pick value you might ink a guy for ten thousand bucks and then use that other 490 to spread it around to other players to try to amass more value in another spot so um yeah getting understanding again you know i, I say the market but really understanding the, the interest within a client um everyone sees everybody differently so again an agent's job is to really assess that and i think more importantly really communicate a player's value um to them to your client you know i had a, a scout a really smart guy say he's like hey nick there's only two players happy on draft day and i'm like okay well who would that be he's like uh first rounders and senior signs everybody else feels like they got screwed <laughs> i was i think it's hilarious it's kind of like this this you know it was a really good statement and this, what he was sharing with me which is you know it's a massive country and the pacific northwest is just a part of it and um, there's a lot of good players out there. So the, I think a good, a good agent is just constantly explaining to a, to a young client who's going through a draft one time, um, you know, really the mechanics of it, how it goes, value, 
the suitors and, and likely where they'll fall. And, um, you know, you want to you want to be very careful about over promising and under delivering that can fracture relationships. So, again, like in life, you just really want to communicate um, and, and work that draft because it can it can be complicated and it happens quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So then a player gets drafted. I'm curious about all of the small details, you know, because my dream would have been to, to be a professional baseball player and to go through that experience. Does each team give you, give the sport, give the agent like a list of, okay, you're contacting this person to get them into housing or a hotel transportation, or are you taking care of all of that behind the scenes on your, on your own, you know, booking the flights, all those different things. You're talking post draft, like when a guy's signed with the club. Correct. Yeah. Clubs have done an amazing job, I think, just through the bargaining agreement, uh, the formalization of the minor league union. Um, you know, clubs are, are really um, much more responsible now. Um, a lot of clubs are building on site housing, or if you're at an affiliate, you know, let's say you're in the, the Mariners, you know, farm system and you're playing out there in Arkansas, you know, they might have uh, housing for those guys in double A. Um, so, um, no, the agent's not putting guys on flights. Club does a great job communicating that. They've got people that do all that. Um, back in my day, I, I mean, I remember going out and in 01, I was making 650 bucks a month, and they'd put you up in like a Ramada Inn. You got a roommate sleeping next to you, and, and you're eating Krispy Kreme donuts across the street and going to the field and having chips and salsa. That, that's a real – that was my, my first year in pro ball. And looking around like, I can't – like, this is professional baseball. Are you kidding me? So – We've come a long way since uh, 2001. These guys um, are, are in a good spot these days. Yeah, I've heard about yeah in the in the updated collective bargaining agreements some of the the uh, the benefits that has pro have progressed throughout the minor leagues. Um, how often are you are you talking with players throughout a season? Uh, very often, you know, all the time. Okay. You know, not, not every day. You know, a lot of guys. Everybody's different. Some guys love attention. Some guys, frankly, don't. Um, and again, I keep probably repeating myself. You got to have that transparent communication um, with each guy, um, because obviously, if you're not communicating with a guy who likes communication or even needs it, um, that can fracture the relationship. There's been times where you just, you know, I can't read people's minds, right? They can't read my mind. Um, but whether it's the emoji fist pound after a guy, you know, hits a homer or throws an inning, you know, something small. Um, but I always tell my guys, like, hey, you got it. Anything you need, let me know. I don't care what it is. You need to help buying a car, you need buying a ring for your, your future, you know, your partner, whatever it might be, you know, um, just know that we're the agency, the, the people within it, we're always here to help. And, and uh, so, yeah, it's a good question. You just asked definitely, definitely is different for every guy. Yeah. And then, and then someone gets drafted, you know, they get a big signing bonus. How do you connect them with financial advisors and other people to walk them through? Is there a class that they take that, helps them understand the spot that they're in and how to make that last as long as possible? It's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, you I think a full service agency needs to provide the, the accounting, the wealth management, um, you know, everything. And and yeah, we, we definitely have people that we, we enlist to assist clients and it's up to the client and you know, they can interview several people and ultimately pick, but um, yeah, you know, a lot of these, everybody, again, everybody's different. And you know, a lot of guys are probably a little more you know, risk averse than others, but the bottom line is you get that, that nest egg and that potential to be that, you know, you want to definitely sit them down, educate them, uh, but it's their money. You know, they, they have family, they have, they have ideas. Um, I've seen guys blow some signing bonuses pretty quick and I've seen guys with plenty of money, not spend a dime. So I think at, at some point we we always want to educate and assist and help. And, and a lot of the, the kids are young, you know, you get 18 year olds drafted, you know, mom and dad need to be involved. That's something that, mm. that I, personally and fundamentally believe in um, absolutely love the relationships with the parents. Um, I mean, what an exciting time to have your, your son here's name called turning professionally at 18. I, I just, every, you know, every year to, the joy that, that I get to experience that on draft day and, and I get chills literally right now um, or debuting, you know, going out and seeing a guy's major league debut. I, I tell my parents all the time. I'm like, you know, every single year, pretty much, if, if, you know, we've been on a pretty good run, we get to go see a major league debut. So it's like, I get to debut in the big leagues every year and to be there yeah. with and dads tearing up. And, um, it's, it is an incredible, uh, incredible thing to be a part of. That's amazing. Yeah. And it's like, 
someone gets drafted, they get their bonus. It's like, hey, maybe go get the, the fake diamonds right now. Oh. You can wear that out on the field. You sound like my CFO. Yeah, that's exactly what he what he says. He was a Conian. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> that's that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so just kind of walking through, like I mentioned, the, the player's career, when someone is going through arbitration, you know, have you, have you had some clients that go through the arbitration process and what does that look like? And I've heard stories of, you know, a player thinks that they're valued at a certain level. The team is trying to get their, their value. And so walk me through the arbitration process and what that looks like from, from your standpoint. From, from my standpoint and from my experiences in arbitration, I'm very thankful that I have the, the, the clients I have. There's a, definitely a type of client I target. Um, I, I'm not into representing everybody. And I tell people in meetings all the time, like, hey, I might not be for you and you may not be for me. And we're here to figure that out. And, and I say that to just say this, that you know, arbitration is a mechanism that um, from an outsider's perspective, um, you know, it can be, can be ugly. And, and it can be ugly within it. Um, I don't represent clients that are uh, greedy, over the top, ready to squeeze every last drop out of a club. Um, mm -hmm. Just not how I believe good you know, business relationships should, should be. I also don't represent guys that don't value themselves you know, on the other side of that coin. So if, to me, arbitration, um, yeah, I've been to it uh, a few times, uh, and it can be it can be very um, ugly in there. The, the, the player uh, hears things. That's kind of what we read, right? They, they get bashed in front of the club. They get offended and frustrated and irritated. And so, as an agent, you're kind of coaching them up, like, "Hey, you're gonna you're gonna hear why they don't think you're worth what we're seeking. And in order for them to achieve their goal, they're gonna have to show some negative things about you, and you're gonna need to stomach that." Um, mm -hmm. you know, you want to prep your client for that because if you don't, they walk in there and hear that it's natural human reaction to probably emotionally want to fire back. Um, but on the flip side of that, you also get to defend your guy and you get to fight for your guy and you get to put your best foot forward. And, um, and again, I just feel like, you know, we always say it like we, both parties want to walk away from any sort of negotiation and feel good about it. And that's always, I think the common goal. And I like to represent guys that understand that. Some people go into negotiation and they just have to win. And um, I think agents that, that talk like that, lead like that, that, that's just not who I am. That's not the agent I ever aspire to be. Um, I don't need to, to win and I sure as heck don't need to lose. I want to feel good about it. I want my client to feel good about it. I want my client to be valued and compensated for his value. So mm -hmm. you sync all that up, um, you actually can walk away in a good spot. So that, that's, how, that's probably my two cents on arbitration. Yeah, finding the middle ground between the club and the player. And then, you know, once you get through those arbitration years, let's get into like contract contract negotiations or even the free agency process. So, you know, at what point are clubs or, you know, uh, negotiating a free agent deal or before they get to, to uh, free agency, what does that process look like as a whole? Yeah, you know, you're you see in in today's day probably more so than in previous seasons. You know, guys are kind of trying to buy out those years, you know, the arbitration years, and give club maybe the club some years after that, um, some option years. You know, there's definitely conversations that occur throughout seasons. You know, as we're trying to maybe achieve that for guys. Um, again, it's got to make sense for the club. Um, they're they're looking to always just find that right value piece for players. Age is a factor, obviously. Health is a factor, um, and then on-field performance is a massive factor. And and um, yeah, you create those relationships. You're definitely reaching out, just trying to make sure that if that's an option, you know that that uh, your clients are are into that. There's a lot of agents that want to exhaust every single season, every single year, and there could be a lot of risk with that. Um, you know, whether that be injuries, you know, leaving some money on the table for guys when they could potentially, you know, amass some generational wealth. So. The free agency markets um, definitely heats up, you know, every year, whether you're on that minor league side or major league side. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun time when you've got a guy that everybody wants. You can hear from a lot of clubs and you feel a lot of offers and, you know, a lot of offers are always the same, which, you know, is kind of interesting when that happens. Um, you wonder about mm. discussions that may occur. Um, but if you have 10 offers that are all the same, you probably shouldn't take it. You should wait. So. A lot of it's just kind of natural negotiating and, and logical thinking and and then having or understanding your clients. Some guys really want to just sign and secure the job. And some guys are, hey, I'm good to wait till the season starts. I don't care. So 
um, again, it's, it, everybody's different. Every case study is definitely different from one another. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, the communication between clubs on if they're trying to set prices for certain positions. Uh, I, or... I didn't say that. You did. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the one saying that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, who knows, right? Yeah. Um, so then with that, uh, well, uh, let me ask this. What are your thoughts on like a free agency period, like having a, a free agency period? Like right now they can sign whenever you see some guys will hold out until into spring training to try to get top dollar and all that stuff. What are your thoughts on maybe in the next CBA to where do you think the players would, you know, it might, it might not be in the, in the player's best interest because that way they have the most power. If there is no window that they have to sign in, but what are your thoughts on like a potential free agent signing period? I think I, I would be against it for what you just cited. I think it definitely just puts some constraints um, around the players. Um, you know, and I've, I've learned all these years in baseball, you know, it seems like it's probably just a, a life thing, but people are really smart and they figure out ways to beat systems constantly. Um, free market, and being able to control the future and, 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 you know, signing on your time. I think, you know, I wonder what would happen to a guy who, who maybe, you know, within that window, all of a sudden he's up against another deadline, forced to sign a deal he doesn't want or go a place he doesn't want to go to. And that's a real, that's a real life. That's a real issue in, in my opinion. So, you know, I definitely don't have enough information to weigh in, but um, I'm definitely more somebody who is going to lean towards, you know, giving the players the, the power that they have and the right that they have to sign when and where they want. Yeah. And then let's talk about, you know, when someone gets traded, what, what does that process look like? At what point are you the agent hearing about something happening? Is it like, Hey, this might happen or is it he's being shipped off to, to X city? Yeah, you, it, it, there's leaks everywhere. You know, you'll hear from potential professional scouts. You know, those are guys that are watching major league games through the scouting department because the, the, the front office might need information and all of a sudden the name gets pushed and, and that can filtrate down to the scout that drafted the guy or a scout in the community that knows the guy. Someone may, may want to do a check and you might know that guy. He calls and says, hey, you know, player X might be on the move. Just let me know. I got a phone call. And so you kind of hear about it that way. But, you know, those trades are very tight lipped you know, oftentimes they fall through. There's, I mean, there's discussions constantly, I guarantee you, mm -hmm. of the club that we never hear about. Um, guys that get put on, on waivers and pulled back. I mean, there's all kinds of different transactions that can occur that we don't, we're not privy to. Um, but when it happens, you know, I always tell guys, look, if you're getting traded, you're just going somewhere where someone really, really values you, needs you, wants you, likes you. Those are all good things. And not to say that maybe, you know, you're, you're leaving a, a place that you, didn't like. I mean, I, I've got a player that loved the place he was at and got traded, and that was frustrating for that player. And then mm -hmm. wasn't used in the same same capacity. That was a tough that was a tough time for that player. And then I've had other guys that that get traded and they're elated because it, you know they're maybe behind certain guys on a on an elite team and they go somewhere in a rebuilding you know rebuilding season for another team and they get to start the very next day after sitting for a month. So. Um, it's exciting that, you know, getting traded to me, those types of days and discussions is kind of that same, um, reaction or feeling that you get on a draft day. It's exhilarating. There's some movement and, and then opportunity, um, obviously lies ahead. So it can be chaos, but, but typically it's, it's welcome with open arms when it happens. Yeah. It's going to be a, a busy summer coming up as we approach the deadline this year. Um, wh what are your thoughts on the, on the rule changes over the past few years with, the, with the CBA, with the new things that are being added, you know, the, the pitch clock is sped up even more this off season. It feels like the players really don't have much of a say in what's going on and the actual changes, because if you look at the rules committee, like who votes on these rule changes, I believe ownership has a overruling majority of votes to where even if all the players and the umpire voted against something, then the rule would still go into effect. So what are your thoughts on, on the past few years with, with everything that's been changing? Well, baseball players are pretty strong dudes, and they don't like being told what to do very often. I can assure you <laughs> that. So I think the majority are not thrilled with it. Um, as a fan, I love that I can put a game on at 6.30 and, and truly know it's over by 8.30, but that's like the 45-year-old guy with two kids talking. <laughs> I mean, I love – I'm a baseball you know purist. I mean, I love a, a one nothing game. I remember those games. It could be one nothing or 2-2 two to two into the 16th inning. I'd sit up all night and watch that. So I understand that most people aren't built that way. Most people want to, you know, we're, we're, we're on to the next. We swipe all the time, right? We're, we're scrolling. 
Um, the rules, you know, the, the one that I'm kind of intrigued by is the challenge rule in the minor leagues. You, you have a, a low A level there where a batter can step out and touch his helmet and, and mm-hmm. you know, then the track man reads if it's a ball or strike. So you can kind of challenge the umpire. Um, I think there's a part of me that really likes that. And I also think the pitcher should be able to challenge. If we're going to let batters challenge, then pitchers should challenge too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll be interested to see where that one goes. Um, you know, the bases basically being like giant pillows out there. I mean, that, that sure makes it pretty easy to go grab bags now. Um, picking off twice, you know, I, that, that thing's, that's tough, I think, especially as a, in my, again, if we all relate it to ourselves, but I was a, I was a crafty lefty. I didn't throw a hundred. So, I mean, I had to really manage the run game and only be able to throw over twice. That would significantly hamper my playing day. So, yeah, I, 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 uh, I don't play anymore, so I don't really, I can't weigh in kind of like these guys on the field, but I've had conversations with many that, that aren't exactly thrilled with it. I'll leave it at, leave it at that. Yeah. And uh, with that robo ump or the challenge, it's, I think Angel Hernandez might have retired at a perfect time with with that coming in. Otherwise, <laughs> it'd be overturned those, all game. Yeah, those are great, great memes. Or uh, you know, Instagram, <laughs> Instagram watches. Those are the best. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you think the uh, the PPI and the prospect promotion incentive pick has helped fight against the service time manipulation like it was intended to, or do you see the and you can talk from generalities, of course. Like, do you think teams are still holding on to their guys for that extra year of service time? Yeah, I, I mean, 100%. I mean, I think, again, it's going to come down to, to a certain organization who wants to kind of shoot for that. Um, but, yeah, without naming names or organizations, I, I just think that these are really, really intelligent men and women running these organizations that are going to run them, you know, as astutely as they can in business. And so – you know, the compensation and the picks and all the things that come with it are great. Um, I think it's a good move to try to stimulate players from being blocked. Um, um, but yeah, you know, kind of hedging my words, I guess, a little bit. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's exactly going to um, create what it was intended to do. Um, but we'll see. We'll see if it, if it keeps moving in that direction. Yeah. Have you been to all 30 stadiums? What, what are your, what's your favorite stadium in baseball? It's funny you ask that. I was doing. I've been, I have been to all but five. I was just literally doing okay. this. I was on a trip back east last week and with a business partner. And I'm like, I think I've been to just about all these things. And yeah, there were five five holes on my list. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've uh, boy, what a you know, again, what an awesome part of the job uh, to travel and see all these places. Um, you know, in Seattle, I tell you, I'm sure you've been there a million times. I mean, that's safe or T-Mobile. I keep calling it Safeco. That, on a on a beautiful day, I don't know if there's any city I'd rather be in in the summer first off, but, uh, that's a, that's a special place to see a game. Um, mm. Pittsburgh's phenomenal. That's a, that's a really beautiful backdrop, passionate mm-hmm. fan base. Um, yeah, there, there, there's, you know, like Wrigley is always, you get chills walking in there. I'd take Wrigley over anything probably day game at Wrigley stuff to beat, but, um, sweet Caroline and Fenway. That's another thing you hear that in the eighth inning and it'll blow your mind. So, uh, I've seen some pretty cool spots, but I'd say those are probably the tops. Yeah. How many players do you represent currently in the big leagues? And uh, I mean, I've seen some really cool stories like Cam Boozer with the Red Sox. His, he was an electrician or something like that just a, yeah. a little bit ago. And yep. yeah, now Cam, he's in the big leagues. Yeah. Cam, uh, it's a funny story there. Cam uh, interviewed Cam one of my first years as an agent. It might have even been my first year, 2009 or 10. And he chose a, another agency over us. And, um, you know, there's no hard feelings and, you know, funny how the, how our paths kind of wind and all that, but we reconnected in Arizona. Um, you know, I think it was almost 10 years later, 11 years later. And, um, he, he had no job and he just walked out to me. He's like, Hey Nick, I he represented a lot of guys I know through the years at Oregon state and Pacific Northwest. And, and, you know, we kind of long story short, just kind of kept in touch that off season, watched him fill a few times and, He's throwing a hundred from the left side, so obviously there's a lot to like. But you know, a lot of agents, you know, won't chase guys even at 30 years old or, or 29. I think he was at the time. Um, but I, I, um, I really respect that guy. I mean, you want to talk about a story? I mean, man, he's um, he's an incredible human being who's persevered like very few have. Um, and I, I think not necessarily the, the and and he he too he's so humbled to be in the big leagues, but he's he. Um, you really, you really changed. You really went through a lot, a lot of hard times. 
um, that he's very open about. And to see just a man overcome um, trials and, and see where he is now is just, it's just a tremendous story. So yeah, to be a part of his journey and, you know, help him get to the Red Sox and, um, you know, he didn't get up all, all last year. He sat in AAA. Um, there were tough times in AAA, but he finished really strong and, um, boy, he hasn't, he hasn't stopped since. So, um, yeah, Cam's been a, a tremendous story and a fun, fun story to be a part of. How about, uh, Zach McKinstry with the Tigers? Yeah, I love Zach. He's it's funny. Last night he had a homer and a triple. And again, it's kind of, people don't understand. They'll look at a, at a, at a statistic, right? They'll see a batting average or they'll, Hey, what's wrong with Zach? Why isn't he playing? Well, you know, the reason he's not playing is there's a dude in front of him making about $27 million a year and playing his spot. And there's other guys too that are super talented that have contracts. And, you know, Zach's a guy that that's hitting arbitration this coming off season. And he's, he's a backup player in the big leagues. And it's like, Oh, well, boo hoo. Like he's, he's making what, you know, over three quarters of a million dollars playing in the big leagues. And he's got just such a wonderful mindset. And he, he's literally, we've had conversations. He's, you know, he's, he's human. He's frustrated. He wants to play, but he's, you know, we say it all the time, control what you can control. So he, he's out on the field every day. He's taking his ground balls. He's taking his fly balls. He hits, he lifts weights. He's never been in better physical shape because guess what? He's not playing every day. So he's, he's super healthy, super strong. His mind is on point. <clears throat> and he gets put in last night in Texas and, you know, drives in two runs and essentially, you know, they win the game three to one. So, um, he's a super talented player that um, is has been caught behind the Dodgers, you know, superstars, the Cubs. He he stumbled a little bit there. He'll own that. Um, and man, has that guy grown though? He's it's funny. I've I've never felt more confident about a 200 hitter in my life because I know he's a 300 hitter. He just hasn't had his opportunities. So I assure you, when they come, that man's going to be ready. And uh, again, I'm so blessed to stand by a, an unbelievable character um that that guy has i mean so many people would have sabotaged their careers gotten frustrated become a bad teammate you name it even at that level um that guy has done the opposite he's just um grinded and stayed the course and he's waiting for his next opportunity it's pretty special and they're they're also building something pretty special with the tigers i think with the young talent that they have coming up and for him to be a part of that is is going to be special at some point uh how about the guy on the on the wall there ryan thompson yeah, Ryan, he's, um, if, I mean, again, it, it, it's, uh, my college catcher calls me one day. He's like, Hey man, there's this guy, Ryan Thompson. I'm like, okay, well, who's Ryan Thompson? He's like, well, he's this dude from Turner, Oregon. And he just led the the country in ERA. And I'm like, really? Like, who's this? How have I never heard of this guy? So I, I'm literally sitting at the same desk when this happened, you know, and I hit the, hit the old Google machine there. I punch his name and I see like a, you know, a, you know, point, whatever the ERA was out of Campbell. And he had just finished his first pro season with Houston. And he put up like, a, I think he had like 24 innings, memory serves, 24 strikeouts, maybe a 180 RA. And uh, Jason Searle, my, my dear friend from Willamette, uh, calls me and, and tells me like, I, I've coached this kid. You guys are like the exact same. Just, you're going to love him. Call him. He needs an agent. I'm referring him to you. And I'm like, okay, 24th round guy, you know, but he's a Salem guy and he's obviously good. I hit him up. And here we are like nine years later and Ryan and I are, I mean, I think it's these, he's, he's a brother. He's incredible. And mm -hmm. he's been in two world series. He's, he's crushing it with the diamondbacks. His whole exodus with Tampa is another crazy story in itself. We can share off offline if you want, but okay. uh, amazing, man. Just, uh, you know, how, how crazy is it that your college catcher calls you and, and sends you a guy that'll be a friend forever and and uh, you know what five year big leaguer four five year and and keep he's gonna keep going trust me so he's gonna have a very long career that that man will play until he until he wants to stop he'll pitch well into his forties I, I guarantee it and I mean that unique arm slot that's you do, you just don't see that that's what you got like the Taylor Rogers or the Rogers brothers you know one one of them throws in the eighties but because of his release spot um, release point so that's awesome. Yeah, it's fun working with Ryan. A, a large part of our agency, we're really hands-on in development. You know, we have facilities in Arizona and in the Pacific Northwest. And so we get to take these big leaguers in the offseason and and tinker with them and tweak them. And um, Ryan spent some time with a dear friend who's worked with us a long time um, during COVID. And they kind of just rebuilt pitches and tinkered and had fun. And all of a sudden, you know, kind of like what you're talking about, that unique slot created some different things that they discovered. And it, it's really helped uh, helped his career tenfold 
Absolutely. Well, Nick, really appreciate your time. It's really interesting to hear your backstory and a little peek into the life of a sports agent. I'm sure I'll get you on again at some point soon, maybe get some more of your, your clients and we'll uh, talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Appreciate the time very much and love what you do. We'll keep in touch. Appreciate it. Out to center. This is great. It's way back. And